Hello, my sisters. Welcome to Great Souls. It's finally your time for accounting. I am Luni, and with me is Ashraf. How are you, Ashraf? Good, and you? I'm good, thank you. What are we doing for the Great Souls today? Great Souls, today the emphasis is on the balance sheet. Now, when they hear that, they go into panic mode. Yes. But what do we always tell them? Don't fear when Ashraf is near. I'm <laughs> going to highlight salient features of the balance sheet, things that you must take note of, and I'm sure by the end of the show, you'll be a star, an Thanks. accounting star. Thank you so much. Great tells you heard it, never fear when Ashraf is near. He's going to help you with your balance sheets, and I'm going to learn with you guys as well because I never did accounting. But anyway, <laughs> make sure you catch us on Facebook and Twitter at Learn Extra. Remember to download all your show notes, your videos, and your schedules on learn.mindset.co.za. And if you don't know by now, you, I'm sure your friends would, would have told you, though. The Chase Yourself competition is still running, guys. So all you need to do is download the show notes, which I have posted on our Facebook page. And then you c complete the Chase Yourself questions. After you've done that, there is a link on our Facebook page as well for the entry form. You fill that in, you fill in your questions, and then you submit it. Remember, guys, you, you do have until 10 p.m. to do all of that. So if you want to watch the show first and then do the test yourself afterwards, you can do all of that, and then we'll announce the, winda the winners on Monday's show. So make sure you do that, guys, to send a chance to win 110 rand, but it'll come eight times. With that said, Ashraf. Yes, over balance to the balance sheet. sheet. Yes. Okay, let's start with the balance sheet and... Obviously, like we said, the focus is on the balance sheet. And with regards to the balance sheet, what are we looking at? Let's start with the challenge question. The challenge question says, where in the balance sheet will you place an item that says insurance claim? Now, you may or may not have heard of it. But think, insurance claim? Where will I place this item in my balance sheet? Okay, so that's your challenge question. Let us take a look now at, the obviously, grade 12s, when it comes to the balance sheet, your note number one, your note number two, your note number three are all the same notes that you have done in grade 11. They don't change in any way. So therefore, what we have decided for today's show is to place emphasis on the changes. That means what is applicable to companies. In other words, let's take a look at this one here. The ordinary share capital. You start off one by saying the authorized amount, obviously, that is the maximum number of shares that the company is registered with in its MOI, in the memorandum of incorporation right and notice that there is no value attached to it none whatsoever why because all that that gives you is the number of authorized shares that the company is allowed to sell coming to the issued when dealing with the issued what do we say watch this here we say one we had 200,000 ordinary shares in issue at the beginning of the year, right? So, that is obviously your opening balance in your ordinary share capital account. Then what, what transpired during the year? During the year, we had another 40,000 additional shares that were issued during the financial year at the issue price of 3 Rand per share. So at this point, grade 12s, allow me to take this a little bit further for you. For example, let's look at this explanation here. If we say we had 200,000 ordinary shares, 200,000 ordinary shares, and these were issued at 2 rand each, obviously, if you do the maths, that will give you a figure of 400 thousand rand that is your rand value of your shares right then we issued a further 40,000 shares 40,000 shares at three rand each okay 
Now, if you multiply that, that will give you a figure of 120,000 rand. Remember, these are my rand values. Now, if I need to know what is the average price of those shares, a very important calculation, what do I have to do? I have to add the number of shares, okay? And the number of shares will be 240,000 shares, right? And I add the value of those shares, and the value of those shares are 520,000 rand. Obviously, you can see what you now have to do is we have to pick up our calculator, James. Hmm. And, okay, we'll come back to that calculation just now, right? We'll find our calculator. What we have to do is take the value of the shares, which is 520,000 rand, and divide it by what? By the number of shares. And when we do that calculation, that will then give us the average price per share. Okay, now, this is critical. Remember that when you are working with a repurchase of shares, what are you going to do? In your repurchase of shares, you're going to say repurchased 30,000 shares. And in this particular note, you have to specify the average price of those shares. Okay, now, obviously, in the note ordinary share capital, you can only work with the average price. Now, if these shares were bought for more than the average price, then the difference between the average price and the repurchase price is another amount which we're going to use somewhere else. Okay, so now what's important for you to note is that in the ordinary share capital, you always work with the average price of your shares. And once again, how do we calculate the average price? Remember, you add the value of your shares, 520,000, divided by the number of shares, 240,000, and the average price would obviously be 520,000 divided by 240,000. That will then give you your average price in rands. Okay. Obviously, we're not doing a particular example. We're just showing you on how to calculate the average price. Now, coming back to the note. Obviously, then, look at this now. This is important. 200,000 200, plus the 40,000 is 240,000 minus the 30,000, right? So, that will then tell you how many shares you have left over at the end of of your financial year okay now that is your closing balance now what is important for you to note is that in your ordinary share capital account remember this closing balance that you're going to find once you have put in all your entries regarding the balance the further issue of shares the buyback of the share this closing balance that you're going to calculate in your ordinary share capital account has to be identical to this balance here where it says the balance of my ordinary shares at the end of the year. In other words, mindset is, what am I saying? I'm saying that the balance that you find in your ordinary share capital account is exactly that same balance, this one here. It's this balance here that would appear in my note, in which note? In my ordinary share capital note. So understand that this ordinary share capital note is a replica of the ledger account, but it is in vertical format with all the details appearing alongside it. So that, grade 12s, is how you would reconstruct, how you would develop this note, ordinary share capital, obviously, if you find a challenge with it, my advice to you is go to the ledger account, draw a T account, and that will show you exactly what you need to do. Okay, coming back to the retained income note. Once again, 
you start off with your retained income at the beginning of the year. In other words, that is your opening balance. Remember, the balance at the beginning of the year. Obviously, that comes from your trial balance. It's a given figure. It's something that you extract from your trial balance and you slot it into your note. Number two says net profit after tax. Now be careful. It's your net profit after taxation. Now once again, let me draw your attention to something which you have done already and you should be okay with. In my appropriation account, this figure that appears on the credit side here, which comes from my profit and loss account, remember, that is not my net profit after tax. That is my net profit before taxation. Do you recall from the lessons that we have done that in your income statement, you have a figure that says, net profit after tax yes that's the figure that you will use in your retained income in the note so it's your net profit after tax please be careful on the different permutations on what information is provided to you and how you will go about doing the necessary calculations okay now watch this here the next item in that note says repurchase of shares and we have specified to say it's the difference so what do we mean by this here let's take an example if we say for example let's do it here that the average price of the share was five rand okay and we had repurchased this share at 7 Rand. So clearly you can see a difference between the average price and the repurchase price. Therefore, there's a difference there of 2 Rand per share. Now, if we simplify it and make it very, very simple, then the if we just take that, assuming we had obviously it's not going to happen in reality, but if we break it down to one single share, in this particular repurchase, we will say 7 Rand. Sorry, let me redo that. We said we want the repurchase price. And here we want the average price. The average price was 5 Rand. Okay. So, in this note here, we put in the 5 Rand here, which is the average price of the share. And in my retained income note, we put in the 2 Rand. So obviously, what I've done there is I've broken it down to one share. Obviously, it's not going, you're not going to buy back one share. But just to illustrate to you, so that you know exactly what price will you use where. So once again, in my ordinary share capital, I use my average price. And I, in my retained income, I use the difference between the repurchase and the average price. So therefore... In this repurchase of shares, and remember, it's always a subtraction because you are, obviously, the double entry is what? It's a credit to bank and a debit to retained income. And when you are debiting your retained income, you are decreasing your equity, therefore, debited. Okay, so that deals with the repurchase and the buyback of shares. Then you come to your ordinary share dividends. With regards to your ordinary share dividends, remember, it's your paid amount, which is your interim dividend, and it is your recommended amount, which is your final dividend. These two dividends are then added together to give you the total of your dividends. Just remember that with dividends, you've got to read the question very carefully to see whether the new shares that you have sold, whether they were sold X dividend or cum dividend. What do I mean by that? The new shares that are sold this year, do they qualify for a dividend? Yes, they were sold cumulative with a dividend. That means they qualified for a dividend. However, you may get a scenario where the new shares are sold 
ex-dividend, meaning they do not qualify for this particular dividend. And therefore, that must be taken into consideration when you are doing your calculations. So, if we summarize what we have done, you would notice that these two notes are unique to a company. And yes, if you master these two notes, then definitely all the other notes are a piece of cake. Chocolate cake. Okay? <laughs> so you know what's our favorite here. Yes. All right, guys. So look at this once again. Remember, the formats are important. Do not expect that you will be given this detail in the exams. If you get it, good luck. If not, make sure you remember. And that's another tip for you, for preparations. Yes, when you're preparing for any class activities, control tests, June exams, prelim, final, whatever it may be, practice on your formats as well. Tell yourself, right, let me draw up the retained income note. What am I going to put in there? Balance at the beginning of the year. Net profit after tax. Repurchase of my dividends, the difference then my ordinary share dividends, and then obviously my balance at the end of the year. So that's the route to go, guys. Make sure that you practice with these notes and you understand them, and that is important. Over to you. All right. Mind teachers, you are going to take a break. Don't go anywhere. We'll see you straight after this. Mindsetters, welcome back. Just quick shout out to Wane Lengule and Lori. Just a question from Pushka. Hey, Luna, please help. Yo, Luna, Luni, please mm -hmm. help. I want to fill in the test yourself answer sheet, but it has 10 questions. 10 question spaces, but the notes only have 8 questions. Okay, Pushka, all you need to do is answer all you have. Like, don't worry about the number of questions and the number of spaces. Fill in anything you can and then. The amount of questions you answer correctly will take those into consideration. It doesn't matter about the spaces and everything else. Okay. Hope you're cool with that. Asha. Yes. yes. Are we back? Yes. Okay, guys. What are we going to do now? I'm going to highlight salient features on the balance sheet that you would normally find in your exams. Let's look at this one here very carefully. What are we told? We are told that the loan statement from Superbank... On the 30th of June, reflects the following. One, it tells you that your balance at the beginning of the year is the 384,000. Then you've got your interest that has been charged to that account, which has been capitalized, of 57,600. Right? Then you are told that your monthly payments in terms of the loan agreement, right? which includes the interest, right, is an amount of 105,600, and therefore your balance at the end of the year is 336,000 rand. Now remember, whenever you are doing a calculation or you're doing anything with a loan, what is it that you have to remember? You have to remember the following. One, when it comes to a loan, Remember that your loan is a liability and by definition, when we talk about a non-current liability, we are saying that the loan will be repaid over a period greater than 12 months. So, break the loan up into its two components. And what are the two components? One is your non-current liability, that means greater than 12 months, and the second one is your current liability, meaning less than 12 months. In other words, in other words, whenever you're faced with a loan in your balance sheet, look for information. What are you looking for? Let's go back to the question and see. It tells us there that these monthly payments include the interest and the capital repayments of the loan, a total of 105,600, okay? So that was the interest plus the capital portion of my loan. And, you know, critical when it comes to accounting. 
what do we specify? We say R T F Q. Let's go further. The monthly capital repayment of the loan will remain constant until the loan is fully repaid on the 30th of June. In other words, the capital portion of the loan that will be repaid over the next financial year will remain constant. Now watch this here. We have paid a total of 105,600. So 105,600, right? That's the total amount that we have repaid. Minus the interest of 57,600. Remember that's given information. Will give me a figure of 48,000 Rand. Now, what is the 48,000 Rand? Obviously, the 48,000 Rand is the capital portion of the loan that you have repaid. In other words, in other words, watch. When I'm working with my loan, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to say my loan balance at the end of the year is 336,000. Watch the layout, please, guys. Very important. Open my bracket. 336,000. Okay, that's my closing balance. That's the balance that I have in my loan account. Minus, remember we worked out a calculation. What was my calculation? I said, take my total amount that I repaid, which was 105,600. There it is, okay, on my calculator. Minus the interest portion. On the, and the interest portion that was capitalized was 57,600, as you can clearly see. So I subtract that from my capital portion, or the, po or the portion that was repaid, and I'm left with a balance of 48,000. So therefore, 336 minus 48,000, okay, and 336,000, minus the 48,000 will now give me a figure of 288,000. What is the 288,000? That is the portion of my non-current liability. What do we know by definition? A non-current liability is that portion of the loan that is repayable over a period greater than 12 months. Now, Look at your current liability. Once you have subtracted that component from your non-current liability, you need to put it somewhere. It needs to go somewhere else. Why? Because it has shifted from being a non-current liability to being a current liability. And therefore, you have an item called a short-term loan or the current portion of your loan. Right? And here you can clearly see that that features under current liabilities and the amount is 48,000 Rand. Simple, guys. When it comes to a loan, break the loan up into two components. What are my two components? The non-current liability, as you can see, payable over a period greater than 12 months, right? And the short-term loan, would then feature under current liabilities on the face of my balance sheet and the item the amount there would be 48,000 rand so now when it comes to a loan remember the trick two legs non-current and the current separate that loan notice something else that I've done here whenever you work in the balance sheet or in the income statement or anywhere else in your accounting paper Show calculations. Why? Because you get part marks for your calculations. So make sure that you show your calculations. Okay, done and dusted. Let's go to the next one. Now the question says, one third of the fixed deposit matures on the 31st of August 2013. The fixed deposit is valued at 60,000 Rand. Okay. Once again, what do we know about a fixed deposit? A fixed deposit would fall under the category 
of a financial asset. Therefore, on the face of my balance sheet, you will notice here, on the face of my balance sheet, I have an item that says financial assets fixed deposit. Here again, be careful. Whenever it comes to a fixed deposit, separate the fixed deposit into two components. What are the two components? Once again, let's look at the fixed deposit account. There's my fixed deposit account. Remember that it is an asset and it has a debit balance. Obviously, assets have debit balances. Therefore, when I work with my asset, remember, I need to separate it once again into the two components. What are the two components? One, which has a maturation period of greater than 12 months. And number two, the one that will mature within the next financial period that is within 12 months. So separate it again into two components. Let's go back to the question to identify what we need to do. One third of the fixed deposit will mature on the 31st of August 2013. That means within the next financial period, you're going to get one third of that fixed deposit maturing. So separate the fixed deposit. Break it up into two components. What are the two components? The component greater than 12 months and less than 12 months. Watch this here. So in my fixed deposit, we have at Supra Bank, once again, I open my bracket. Start off with a given figure of 60,000. There's my 60,000. And I'm told one third of that figure, obviously a third of 60,000 is 20,000. So you subtract the 20,000 from that figure to give you a final answer of 40,000 where Watch this. Under my financial asset, I now know that my fina financial asset has a balance of 40,000 Rand. Remember something else. This appears on the face of my balance sheet. Okay. Now, where will the 20,000 go to? All right. Let's sort out the 20,000. Let's sort out the 20,000. Create some space there. Okay. The 20,000 Rand, which will become available to you in the form of cash within 12 months, will now feature in my note cash and cash equivalents. Okay, remember this, guys, that your cash and cash equivalents is a note to your balance sheet. However, you find examiners sometimes asking you not to draw up the notes to the balance sheet, but rather to show calculations on the face of the balance sheet. Therefore, under your item, cash and cash equivalents, you would open up your bracket. Okay, let's identify the items that would go under cash and cash equivalents. Remember, it will be your fixed deposit maturing within 12 months in our example year. It would be the figure of 20,000 Rand. Plus, what else would you have? You would have your bank if it is favorable. What else would you include in there? Your petty cash, your cash float, all your cash items would feature under the item cash and cash equivalents. Okay, got that. So, separation in our example here, what have we now done? We have separated the fixed deposit into two components. What are those two components? This one here, greater than 12 months. The 20,000 Rand, less than 12 months. Let's, let's show you how practical and how, what's the rationale for doing this here. If you're a reader of this balance sheet, immediately you can tell yourself, okay, fine, in this business here, there's an amount of 40,000 Rand in a fixed deposit to which we will not have access within the next financial period. Yes, we will have access to 20,000 Rand 
which will mature. So you can you see, it, it, it's, it's providing information to the reader. And in that way, you, will, you understand why there's always logic in what we do in accounting. We do it. Accountants do it with logic. Okay, so that was the fixed deposit. Let's look at another, another question. The following balances appeared in the books on the 28th of February, 2013. You had a figure for creditors control of 720,000. And you have a figure for cash at bank, 66,000, which is favorable because they're not giving you any further information. So then you assume that that is a debit balance. But remember, whenever it comes to bank, what is important for you to note is that what is the status of my bank account? Is my bank account favorable or is my bank account unfavorable? Why? Because if my bank account is favorable, then, then, it's, then it's an asset. But if my bank account is unfavorable, then my bank account is definitely a liability. So keep that in mind. Remember, when I'm dealing with bank, I must have my wits about me in deciding whether to check and see is it an asset or a liability. What are we told? We are told that on the 20th of February, it was established that a check issued to a creditor was post-dated for the 15th of April to the value of 50,000 Rand. Right. Now, obviously, this information you would glean from your bank reconciliation statement. You would find it there. It would say, debit outstanding checks, checks not presented for payment. In this case here, it is an uh, it's a, it's a post-data check that we have issued. Now the question that you need to ask yourself is, in reality, have we paid the creditor the amount of 50,000 Rand? And the answer, great 12s, is an emphatic no. We have not paid. Why? Yes, we have paid by making an entry in our journals, in our CPJ. We recorded the payment, but the actual payment, the money has not left our bank account and that is important and there's no way it can leave our account why because the check is post dated therefore what do we do and it's very simple it's very simple if you just remember it like this here what is the entry the entry is debit bank and credit your creditors control Okay, so when I say debit bank, look at your bank account. And you can see that your bank account was, was a favorable 66,000 Rand. Therefore, under cash and cash equivalents, it's 66,000. When I say debit bank, it means I'm increasing my bank plus the 50,000 Rand of the post data check. And at the same time, when it comes to trade and other payables, we say the balance was 720,000 Rand. And credit creditors control, so I add it to my creditors control and the amount is 50,000 Rand. Watch here, watch this very closely. Because bank was favorable, and by me debiting bank, I would increase the balance of my bank account, okay? And creditors control, by crediting it, I'm increasing my liability plus 50,000 Rand. But please take into consideration that if my bank account was in overdraft, then definitely you would not be doing what I've done here. Why? Then you would reduce the value of your overdraft. What do we mean by that? Watch this here. If your bank account has a credit balance and if you are debiting it now with 50,000 Rand, then clearly you can see you are reducing your overdraft. What you have to remember, the entry is a debit to bank and a credit to your creditors control. Don't you stray or go away because we're waiting for your questions on Mindset. <laughs> All right, Mindset is don't you stray or go away. Quick shout out to Nondo Miso and Honte. We'll see you straight after this break. Hi 
there, hi there, hi there, hi there. Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. We're still doing accounting. Asha? Yes. Time for all questions. Yes. So, okie dokie. Fire so away. Are you going to do the challenge question first or should we start? Let's take a question first. All right, let's do the challenge question first. All right, okay. Okay. Remember, let's go back to our challenge question. And what was the challenge question? The question was, where in the balance sheet will you place the item insurance claim? Now, before we place it in the balance sheet, let us first understand what do we mean by an insurance claim? And let me illustrate by an example. Okay, in this particular example that we have here, let's take the case where a vehicle that we have lost due to, uh, due to theft or an accident, which was insured with the insurance company, right? And the moment that happens, remember, you have to do an asset disposal. Okay, now, once again, when you mention asset disposal, they go into freak mode <laughs> because it's something like it's a, uh, some ogre out there that's going to catch them. Uh. But yes, guys, if you just do some basic steps when you're calculating asset disposal, and maybe this is a good time for me to show it to you. Watch this. Whenever you are doing an asset disposal, just do this here. Depreciation, cost price, accumulated depreciation, carrying value, selling price, profit or loss on sale of asset. In other words, if you follow these steps here, when it comes to an asset disposal, then definitely, then definitely, you're going to see when you are dealing with the selling price here, when you are dealing with the selling price, this one here, that's the that's a, that's a point that I'm emphasizing right now. One of the ways in which we can dispose of an asset is where the insurance company has acknowledged the claim but have not paid us as yet. Okay, so if that happens, this means that what is my double entry? My double entry would be a debit to insurance claim. So let's open up the T account. There's my insurance claim. And I'm debiting it. Let's take the amount to be 10,000 Rand. 10,000 Rand. And remember, I'm crediting my asset disposal with 10,000 Rand. So now, this 10,000 rand in the insurance claim, that one there, what happens to it? It's a balance sheet account. It is a debtor. And therefore, this insurance claim will now feature in my note, which note? It would feature in my note, trade and other receivables. And yes, grade 12s, what is it that goes into my note for trade and other receivables? You are supposed to know this note by now already. Let's go through it one more time. So that just to refresh your memories. One, you start off with your debtors control or your trade debtors, right? Then you have your provision for bad debts. Remember that this is a negative asset. And what do we mean by a negative asset? It reduces the value of your asset. Notice the figure appears in brackets, and that gives you net trade debtors. Okay, getting on with that note, the next item that you would have in my trade and other receivables would be accrued income. I would have my prepaid expenses right okay what else would I have there I would have there I would also have in that note there I would have my insurance claim that I just spoke about now the insurance claim remember it is an asset it's amount that the insurance company owes the business 
So therefore, you can clearly see it falls under my trade and other receivables. What else would feature in my note for trade and other receivables? Watch. I would include in that one, which one? SARS income tax. Yes, something new that you have learned this year in companies. The critical part is SARS income tax on the condition that it has a debit balance. Right. And then finally, another item that could appear under my trade and other receivables would be my deposit for water and electricity or a deposit for any other item that we, are, we have paid a deposit for. So, coming back to the challenge question. The challenge question says, where in the balance sheet would you place your insurance claim? The answer to that is under trade and other receivables. There's it. Done and dusted. Challenge sorted out. All right. Thank you for that. And then Sianda is asking, is bank favorable when it's on the debit or credit side in the trial balance? Okay. Good question. Watch here. Let's do the, the, both the scenarios. You can see exactly what we are referring to. Here's your bank account. And in this case here, my bank account has a debit balance of a thousand rand. Now, obviously, this will make it much easier for you. And I'll link this question to the bank reconciliation. So you draw it, drawing your knowledge from previous experience and making you understand what we are referring to. In our books, when we receive our, in, in our bank account, as it appears in our ledger, remember that when bank is on the debit side, it indicates to me that bank is an asset. Why? Because a thousand rand of our money is kept by the bank. Okay, now let's mirror that. Let's mirror that. And if we mirror it this way here and we see that if we were doing the books of the bank, right? In the books of the bank, we are our businesses, ABC stores. So there's ABC. The bank will have an account for us and it will have a balance on the credit side of a thousand rand. Why is that? The bank will say, watch, if I'm now the bank, watch, I've changed my position. I'm now the bank. What will I say? I'm owing ABC stores. How much? A thousand rand. Can you see? Credit balance on the bank statement. But in our books, we are ABC stores. We have a bank account. And what do we say? We say the bank owes us, therefore, a debit balance in our books indicates a favorable bank balance. So, if we take change the scenario now and we say, okay, now let's open up a bank account. And in this case here now, we say that the bank account has a credit balance in our books of a thousand rand. What does it mean? It means that we have a creditor. We are owing the bank money and therefore the balance is on the credit side, meaning it's an overdraft. So once again, our books, debit balance, favorable bank balance, credit balance, we are owing the bank money. And you can see exactly, if you take that scenario now, take it to the bank situation, and we say, right, here's the bank, ABC stores, and now, what will, a, what will the bank say? The bank will say that ABC stores owes us a thousand rand. So clearly, the point that I'm trying to make here and emphasize is, remember, the perspective that you're looking at it from. When you're looking at, at your perspective, that is the business, we are the business. A debit balance is a favorable bank balance and a credit balance is an overdraft. So when you receive your bank statement, right? I'm sure many of you have bank accounts. When you receive your bank statement, what type of balance do you want to see? Debit or credit? Certainly, you want to see a credit balance on your bank statement. Why? Because the bank owes you that money. Simple. Brilliant. All right. And then another one from Sianda. What are fixed assets? Right. When it comes to fixed assets, remember, your fixed assets are your tangible assets. In other words, if you break down your fixed assets into their categories, 
Let's take examples, examples that you can identify with. One, land and buildings. Right? Land and buildings is what we would term as a fixed asset. It's an asset, firstly, is something that has value. It's a possession of the business. And fixed, the durée or the, the, the value of that asset would not change over a period greater than 12 months. So in other words, we're saying land and buildings is one example of a fixed asset. What do we know? Land and buildings do not depreciate. It means no depreciation for land and buildings. Right. Now we come to the next category of fixed assets, and that is my vehicles. With regard to my vehicles, what do I know? Vehicles are also tangible assets. They are also form part of my fixed assets. However, vehicles are subjected to depreciation. That means they, we will have to depreciate our vehicles when at the end of my financial year. And then another category of fixed assets would be my equipment. Right? And this one as well is subjected to depreciation. Okay, so clearly you can see when we're talking fixed assets, we are talking note number three. Note number three is specifically designed to cater for information on all my fixed assets. Once again, just a bit more on note number three. What do we know? When dealing with note number three, when you start at the top, we have opening balances. And these are my balances at the beginning of my financial year. Right? At the end of note number three, you have balances once again. But these are my balances at the end of the financial year. So what is important now is for you to ascertain what information is given to you. Let me illustrate with one example. Do we have more questions? We've got two more. Okay, let's go to that question then. All right. This one is from Nuno. She's asking you to clarify. So, fix, so fixed deposit maturing within the period of 12 months forms part of the cash and cash equivalents whenever preparing our balance sheet. She's Sorry, did you just repeat that for me? She's asking you to clarify this. Which one? So fixed deposit maturing within the period of 12 months forms part of the cash and cash equivalents when ever preparing our balance sheet. Spot on, my dear. All right. Your fixed deposit that is maturing within 12 months. That means if you're working, let me specify dates for you so it will make it much easier. Let's do that. Let's do that so we can see exactly what we're saying. So we have clarity in our minds. If we are working with a fixed, uh, for uh, the period 1st of January 2013 to December 2013. Right, that's the financial period under review. Now if you are told that a fixed deposit in this, uh, uh, for example, a fixed deposit that will mature on the 10th of February, 2014. You can clearly see that within the next 12 months, this fixed deposit is maturing. Therefore, when you're reporting at this point here in your balance sheet, remember, in your balance sheet, separate the fixed deposit into the two components. One is the financial asset, the one that will not mature within 12 months, and then finally, that portion that will mature within 12 months would appear under my cash and cash equivalents. All right, we've got three questions. Okay, if let's go. If insurance paid half will versus from one nail, if insurance paid half of our claim, how will this affect our balance sheet? Fine. If the insurance company paid half of the claim, then whatever amount is outstanding would mean that that's the loss that you are experiencing. So take your insurance claim. If they've paid you, for example, let's illustrate by means of an account once again. The easiest way to do that is if you have an insurance claim and the, the claim was for 10,000 Rand, surely you can see that when they paid you, if they paid you 5,000 Rand, what would you do? You'll debit bank, money increasing, asset increasing in value, debited, 
credit your insurance claim with an amount of 5,000 Rand. That's the bank figure that we are receiving. Obviously, you can see now that the other 5,000, we were not adequately insured. That means we lost money. How much did we lose? In this case here, you can see that we have lost an amount of 5,000 Rand. We'll credit the insurance claim and debit a loss on the claim or loss due to theft or loss due to fire. All right, and then from Edward, last question. You say land and building does not depreciate. So my question is, does a building depreciate? No, land and buildings do not depreciate. In fact, they appreciate in value. Therefore, you will notice in note number three, you will never ever have depreciation for land and buildings. Guys, that's the end. It's over. It's over. <laughs> but anyway, aim for the moon. Because if you don't get there, you're going to be a shining star. Until the next time, yeah. goodbye. Thank you so much, Asha, for this kind words. Thank you for the great lesson. Thank you, Mindsetters, for tuning in. Remember, aim for the moon. If you don't get there, you'll be a shining star. How do you do a star? Okay, anyway. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. We'll see you next time. Goodbye from us.